welcome to episode 23 of Sharing Life Lessons. This is season 3. I am your host Hamida and I want to bring you stories because stories inspire, stories teach and stories heal. Listeners, for those who heard episode 21, you know we stumbled upon a new tagline for this show, which is, together we are creating a library of stories. And so far, we've created 22 stories together. This is the 23rd one. And also, you know, if you've listened to past episodes, that we've dealt with a lot of topics that are either taboo or stigmas that people don't want to talk about in their families or amongst friends or in society when they really should be. Some of the topics we have discussed in the past episodes are sexual abuse, domestic violence, grief, and mental health issues. Today's topic is one such topic. It is considered a stigma in many people's minds. I wanted to say that this episode is only relevant for women of reproductive age, but my daughter guided me to not say that. Because if you are a male, and you're listening so far, then you have stumbled upon this episode for a reason. There is a possibility that your mother or wife or a sister or a daughter or a daughter-in-law or a really close friend or colleague is suffering from PMDD. And listening to the entirety of this episode will help you support them. Additionally, we will be discussing about ideas like accepting and trusting your body and your emotions because they are on your side. And such ideas uh, can be used by anybody, whether you're a man, a woman, a teenager, a youth, or a child, and under any circumstance. So I invite everyone to hear on till the very end, because you will realize at the end of it that you have learned quite a lot from our guest today. So what is PMDD? For thousands of women each day, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, is an ongoing challenge that has negative outcomes on life. PMDD is a disorder in which a woman's menstrual cycle influences her mental health significantly. And the key word here is significantly, during a time frame before her period begins. So this could be any time as less as two days before her period begins or as much as 10 days before it begins. PMDD statistics indicate that an overwhelming 6 million or 1 in 20 women worldwide struggle with this condition. The actual prevalence is estimated to be even higher because many women may not come forward regarding the concerns because of fear of stigmatization. So today, let's hear from our guest who has struggled with PMDD since she was 19, but she found herself in that struggle And she now has a toolkit to offer to us on how to get to the other side of it. So everyone, please welcome Sophia Wiseborn. Hello, Sophia. Welcome to the show. I am so happy to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a a pleasure and honor to be here. Wonderful. Sophia, please start us off by telling us something about yourself. My pleasure. I am a singer, a speaker, a transformational storyteller, a podcaster. I have two podcasts currently. I'm working on another. My podcasts are Vagina Talks with Sophia Wise One and Medicine Caller Podcast. And I love to help people love themselves and, you know, in through that process, love their life. And I turned that into a card game in a book. I've had a really beautiful and blessed life and challenging life. I've learned a lot and I do my best to just kind of synthesize what I've learned and find ways to share it with people. That's great. And Sophia, all of those links, I hope you can share that with me. I will put it in the show notes. So if any of the listeners want to be able to, they can listen to your podcast or reach out to you. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Great, Sophie. I can't wait to hear your story. Please tell us your story. Okay. So like all stories, they started way before they start. So we'll start in the middle. I was 19 
I was in college. I was studying theater in New York City. I fell in love with a gorgeous girl. I shaved my head. I was doing performance art. It was a great novel of kind of a tale of an artist in a city. And what happened for me after kind of falling in love and leaving my childhood rhythms, my sophomore year of college, things started to get a little rocky. And then my junior year, I went back for junior year and and by rocky, I mean, I fell into a pretty severe depression the second semester of my sophomore year. And I went back my junior year and a couple weeks into the semester, I couldn't, I couldn't be there. It was very clear. I was just emotionally a wreck and I was heartbroken and all of my kind of good girl repressed anger and grief and putting on a good show just kind of cr- it crumbled. And I think that happens for people at all different stages of life. And for me, it, it happened at 19. I left the very loving home and also really challenging home. I had two chronically ill family members and, you know, my whole family just did our best, but we were all navigating a lot of trauma with a lot of skills and a lot of coping. And it all kind of caught up with me. And when I dropped out of college, which I did, and I went back home and I picked up odd jobs and I went back and I saw my therapist that I had been seeing when I was in high school, I sat down with her and she looked at me and she said, this is rhythmic, Sophia. You're you're up and you're creative and you feel good and then you're down and you're self-destructive and you're explosive and you're in a lot of pain. And she said, it looks to me like you might be bipolar or manic depressive, but I want you to track your menstrual cycle because I might be PMDD, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I'm so grateful for her. So I spent the next three cycles tracking myself. And tracking myself looked like taking notes every day in the morning, the middle of the day, and at night of my general sense of being and any other physical symptoms that I was noticing. And what I saw in just three cycles was that completely separate from circumstance, it was entirely rhythmic. These physical symptoms that I was having, belly aches, stabbing sensations, hiccups, headaches, as well as rage, exhaustion, excitement, creative surges, feeling good about myself, feeling terrible about myself. I was able to take that and say, okay. Now, here's the part of our story that is really important to know, which is that I was like a little baby mystic. I came into this world talking about my life before this life and and loving every religious ceremony I was ever taken to. When any religion, any whatever, I was like, I just love being here. <laughs> you know, tell me your story. You know, my mom uh, is a yoga teacher and a brilliant storyteller, and I was really raised in in kind of a a Christ consciousness, very progressive kind of Christian perspective. And so Uh religion was never contrary. I didn't even understand the impacts of Christianity until I was way older because it was so um, inclusive in my upbringing. And so my spirituality was very broad and I just had a lot of faith and I did a lot of creative work and I did a lot of, because of my mom's chronic illness, she had chronic fatigue syndrome in the eighties. And that was before they really recognized it as real, which Uh meant to get any relief. She really needed to kind of follow this doorway that had been opened through yoga. So I grew up, you know, with shamans and acupuncturists and body workers. So when my mind snapped, when my patterns broke, I had a faith and enough exposure to say, I don't think I'm broken. I think this is a healing opportunity. Nice. And I went to work. I went to work. And Mm -hmm. I spent seven years kind of collapsing these foundational beliefs that were creating these stress patterns and then rebuilding a completely different way of relating to myself 
And it was not nearly so much that I changed myself so much as I accepted myself. I was saying the other day that the process of, of trusting my body and trusting my cycle, which is really what it led me into. I got into red tenting or moon lodging, the practice of retreating and going into deep spiritual practice when I'm menstruating. I'm, I'm sorry, Sophia. Uh, listeners may not know what red tenting is. Great. So that's when you, thank you. So that's when you intentionally, whether you do it for an hour, you like light a candle and do a meditation or whether you do a full retreat for the time that you're menstruating, you go into an intentionally contemplative or spiritual practice space. And so there's lots of different ways and there's lots of different traditions that, that kind of do it differently. When I dropped out of college, I went and became a body worker. So I became a massage therapist and a Reiki practitioner and really developed my healing arts practices. And so my red tent practice, my moon lodge time, my communing was a combination of body-based and spirit-based. And one of the things that I would do in this time was I would take, and I still do, I take my questions and my heartache and my desires and I take it into a deep prayer space. And I, and I take it into a prayer space that I, I allow my body to unwind and show me it's kind of its wisdom. A good way to think about this is like, and not like a, not like spiritual woo terms, but in just like concrete terms is in our chemical cycle, when we're um, ovulating or when we're follicular, which is the time before you ovulate, you know, it's just like, there's so much high hormones flowing through your system. It's like your face is more symmetrical and like your brain, it's like, you're just kind of wired. You got all these chemicals that are good for productivity and problem solving and relating and you want to be seen. And then when you're luteal or what's often called premenstrual, this time the hormones really drop down and it really slows. And there's a lot of hormonal shifts that make it you're more likely to be tired or slow or be like kind of physically clumsy. Uh -huh. And those are actually, it's, if you think about it, like if you could take a drug that slowed you down, what would you want to do with you took that drug? And if you were me, when you took that drug, you'd want to meditate, right? So yeah. my body drugs me into yeah. like a prime meditation state. Just sit there, just breathe you're not going to want to be around other people. You're not going to want to eat too much food. You're not going to want to do too much stuff. You're not going to want to linearly problem solve things. You're just going to want to feel and you're going to want to go inside. So that's, that's the drug that my body gives me every cycle. And so moon launching is saying yes to that. And the thing that really healed me in this kind of long process was understanding that not just one of the things that I, when I talk about PMS, I say, remember you're hormonal 365 days of the year. <laughs> you know, it's like, we're not just hormonal when we're menstruating. We're not just hormonal when we're luteal or premenstrual, we're always hormonal. And so what is it to, to on one hand, optimize to take care of your body and your health so that you're creating the best, the best hormones for yourself. And then what is it to just take the hormones that your body is, is making for you and to then accept that as, as a gift or as a drug that's going to optimize certain function and de-optimize other function, you know? And so to really be willing to trust and radically live a life that is really in a rhythm. Now, the worst part about my cycle for a long time in this kind, this journey for me was when I was, and it still is, it's, it's painful for me to remember my premenstrual time. My luteal time was incredibly painful, um, physically mm -hmm. and emotionally. I would feel incredibly aggressive towards the people that I loved the most. And I would start a lot of fights. I'd be standing with a partner and we'd have a conversation and then I'd get like madder and madder. And then I'd just be like, Oh my God. Like, just like screaming, like, are you not listening to me? That kind of screaming. And what I realized was that my, my people pleasing, tending, coping tendencies were so intense that when I felt good, I would just ignore every sign, every no, every boundary. It was all good. I was so flexible. Like people who knew me at that time in my life would just be like, oh my gosh, Sophia is so easygoing. She's so flexible. And then when I would shift, when I get premenstrual, I would call it sticky brain because I was like, I couldn't let anything go. 
And I would get so aggressive and so upset. And, and it wasn't always screaming. It was just like, I was just sitting at home or I, on the phone or texting or writing these long emails and journaling and journaling and journaling, just being like, I am so unhappy. I'm so frustrated. And when I realized what happened was that for two weeks, at least 15 things bothered me that I ignored. And that when my hormones dropped in a certain way and my other hormones surged in another way, and I started to have to give voice to it, I wouldn't just give voice to what was upsetting me in that one moment. It was like I had to explode out. And the way that I talk about it is like, it's your wisdom won't give up on you. So what I knew is that I was ignoring really important messages about the relationships I was having, the choices I was making, the way I was treating my body, the way more than anything else, the way I was treating myself inside my head. It's a very, and very intense self-bullying. And I say that when I'm premenstrual, the, the bullshit detector is at 100%. It's like, I know when somebody's lying 10 feet away, like before they even say it out their mouth, you know? And I do it to myself. And the biggest problem was that I could see how I was out of alignment with myself and I, I hated it and I hated myself for it and I hated my life for it. And so I would, I would just explode. So the wisdom, I s- describe it this way. So you take a snapshot of somebody screaming in the street and throwing sticks out a window and just being like, come down here and talk to me, you know, like, get down here. You know, just a snapshot. You think, is the person crazy on the street or is the person crazy on the inside, right? Like that looks like uh-huh. the crazy person on the outside, you know? But the thing is what you don't see in that moment is that that crazy person politely called two weeks ago and said, I'd like to tell you something. And they got ignored. And then they left a voicemail and said, you know what? This is important. And they were ignored. And then they came by and they knocked on the door and they were ignored. And then they wrote a letter and they put it through the mail slot and they were ignored. But here's the thing. It's important information. So my wisdom, which called and wrote and sent these messages was not going to give up on me. And so until it was a screaming person on the street going, something is not okay here, right? I ignored it. And once I realized that the screaming wasn't my craziness, it was the desperation of my wisdom. I realized I had to change the way that I was listening to myself. That is very interesting. Here's a question that comes to mind. There may be listeners out there who are college students. There may be listeners out there who are young professionals or going through the same premenstrual yeah. symptoms. Now, they are really busy with whatever they're doing. Can yeah. you help them understand how is it that you balanced your time during your premenstrual time between real work that you had to do for college or for, for your company and the meditation and listening to yourself? Yeah. This answer is really difficult for some people to hear, which is that I, uh, I really prioritized and made time. One of the things that I say is that you have to take your medicine, whether it's a pill that you take every day or whether for me, I would wake up three hours before I had to be at my first thing. I had to take my medicine. I had to chant. I had to journal. I had to call my very good friends who would talk to me at 7.30 in the morning to help me process because I'm an external processor. I rode my bike uphill in Philadelphia, up this epic hill while I was having incredible um, thigh pain actually was one of my symptoms that would happen. And I used to scream when I would have to, but just like, just to like move the energy because it would be so intense. I would bike to my therapist for appointments at 7.45 in the morning. Okay. Here's the thing. I, I thought I had to bring down my sensitivity to stabilize. I knew I was unstable. I knew I didn't feel right in myself. I was like, this is not my best self because I have moments of being a clear headed person. And then I would just be like, this is not it. And it was, it would come and go. And so I kept trying to crush myself, my sensitivity to make me more stable, but that didn't work. And when I realized that I had to accept how sensitive I was, but that I had to raise my other skills to match my sensitivity. 
Like if I'm that sensitive, I have to be that good at communicating. If I'm that sensitive, I have to be that good at setting boundaries because I have a sensitive system. I have to be responsible to that system. And so I realized I had to build a whole set of skills that had not been taught to me. And the truth is they had been more taught to me than they had to most people. I had meditation, I had body work, I had acupuncture in my wheelhouse and I still needed to learn more. You know, so I went to therapy, I studied, I studied communication, I studied Healy practices, I built that skill set. And so, so I know this can be a little bit of an intimidating answer. Lots of people's lives are changed by practicing 20 minutes a day, breathing 20 minutes a day, technically 12 minutes a day, (laughs) 12 minutes a day, change your brain chemistry, see where you are in a year, done, just do it, just do it. Like there was no shortcut to understanding and discovering. And here's the thing. I had already paid the cost. I couldn't maintain college. I was already working odd jobs. The people who are, and bless you, (laughs) the people who are managing to keep up with the the pressures of the rat race, parenting or college or, and I did go back. I finished my degree and, and I finished massage school. Like I continued to learn, but I practiced, Mm -hmm. you know, it's just like to just really show up day after day because I knew it. Like I knew I had to. The, The other thing that I'll say about this is, this is what I was saying about mentors and healers. I had to piecemeal so much information for myself. And there's so much more information out now about about menstrual wisdom, about cycles, about working with your cycles, leaning into your hormonal predispositions, optimizing how to nourish yourself. And if to just decide that you're going to do it and decide if you're, so just the moon lodging is just one practice that I would do. Right. And that was just a big risk that I took. I was so scared. I was a massage therapist and I emailed my client list and I said, I will no longer be massaging while I'm menstruating. And if you schedule during that time and we need to reschedule, I hope you'll understand. I'll do my best to not, but sometimes it moves. And every month that I did it, I made more money, not less money at the end of that month. Every time, every time. And you attribute making more money to what? Being in flow, alignment being in integrity with myself. And, and what I invite people to do is, like I said, you can start to nourish and replenish yourself during that time just by saying, instead of watching TV when I'm menstruating at the end of my day, I'm going to light a candle. I'm going to put my hands on my belly and I'm going to say, we'll just be quiet together. Just be quiet. you know. And one of the things that happens in that time is we get insights. We, do, we just do when we're quiet and we make space for ourselves, we get insights. And then the rest of your cycle is about implementing those insights. You realize, oh my gosh, this, you're sitting there and you're going, this one person at work just is not a good fit. Like I have to fire them. Like I have to, they're not a good, we keep trying to make it work and everyone's suffering. So then you sit with it, you let it flow through. And then the next week when you're feeling social, right, you sit down and you say, these are all the gifts. This is the recommendation I want to write you. These are the connections. These are what you're great at. This is not working for us. This is the transition plan. Boom. Right. I, I attribute all of my kind of ups and downs with money. When I'm in alignment, listening to my body, listening to the guidance that I'm getting. I take better care of people. They're better with the work. They are more likely to keep working with me. They're more likely to refer someone to me. They, you know, all of those things, they've just, when I've pushed myself too hard, I, it has always cost me money. Always. Even a program that on paper looked like it should have, I'm pushing, I'm over giving, I'm pouring over my boundaries, which means I didn't charge it right. And now the, running that program cost me money. Like, it's like skiing uphill. You, it's like skiing uphill. Yeah. It doesn't work. No, no, uh-uh. No, no. It's different. It's, you do, it's different. You just put them on your back. You do different. If you have to go, you got to do different things when you're going up the hill, you know? Yeah. I said, I said the other day, you know, it's like, if I try to dive into gravel road, like it's water, it's not going to go well. And mm-hmm. if I try to like walk on the water, like it's gravel, it's not going to go the way that I'm planning, you know? And so it's like, what is it to become real with yourself? Yes. Take care of yourself and make optimize yourself, but more than optimize yourself, just get to know yourself. Just like 
know what your body and your emotions are asking for because we're so trained and taught, especially as those of us who are socialized as female, or identify and really kind of identify with that socialization to take care of others before ourselves. And it's not sustainable. And when we do that, the more sensitive our system is, the less time it's going to last. Sophia, so again, for those who have sisters or wives or or daughters who are going through this yeah. PMDD or the symptoms such as PMDD, yeah. what would you ask them oh. to do for the people who are suffering through PMDD? Uh, absolutely. That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is and we can't really do this for other people, but we can help people do it, which is that if you can encourage them and choose to trust their body, to trust what they need so that when they get electric, when they're having a very difficult time, your response is, it sounds like there's something really important happening. I want to understand what it is to really come from that. Because one of the things that happens often when we're like kind of in that premenstrual PMS state is that we're getting intuitive information. We're getting subtle information that if we're not practiced at interpreting that subtle information, we're going to latch on to something that it's not actually. And a good example of this is I was having this conversation. I was walking with my ex-wife. We were married at the time. And she said, <laughs> she said, da, 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 da. We always do this. And I got this fire up my spine and I was like, what? And then I just, I mean, after a decade of practicing with myself and I said, okay, I'm luteal. Something just set off in me, something very subtle and very important when you said this, but it's not inside the conversation we're having. That's okay. But there's something else. And so I just said to her, I said, just give me a minute because there's something subtle and important here. And as we walked, I said, it was the we statement. She was actually talking about her experience, but she said it like it was our shared experience. And I said that, that's the pattern. That's the pattern that I see happening that see. doesn't feel good. And so it's not, usually it's not the action that's making the extreme response. It's the repetition of a pattern. Mm -hmm. that we become impatient with. And so if you are an advocate, my invitation for you is to become radically trusting that something that they're upset about is they're absolutely correct. And it's just a matter of listening and getting curious and getting subtle enough and getting spacious, maybe feminine enough, but we have to slow down enough. And, and so to be patient and to put yourself aside because the things that set it off can feel very personal. Thank you for sharing that. Sophia, you are now living a nomadic life. You travel from place to place. Did, does that have to do anything with your, <sighs> is there a story behind that? <laughs> Oh, isn't there a story behind everything? Yeah, yeah. So I have this very consistent experience of myself, which is that for those of you who are into stars, I'm a quintuplet Gemini. I'm, I'm very airy. Like I'm like, I like belch a lot. I just, it's like across the board. I'm constitutionally just very airy. I love to move around. It's restorative for me to change locations. So one of the reasons, well, okay, the real reason I got a divorce was because my wife and I came to an understanding that we had served our healing in marriage to completion. And it was like to do the next thing, we had to just really do the next thing. That was why it happened. Some of the personality conflicts that could look like reasons or excuses, but that's not really real because you can always, if you want to, you can make it work. You just choose love and let go of your agenda and make space. But we made space for a different path. But one of the things that she really reflected is she just had this grounded nature, you know, and I would just be like, I'm going to go do this thing next week. And she'd be like, next week, what? You're going to fly across the country and go to this thing. And I just, like, I got this invitation and I'm really excited and I got a scholarship and I'm going to go, you know, and her initial response would be like, 
uh, and then like a couple days later, she'd be like, that sounds like a great idea. Have fun. I love you. Great. But it really exposed to me how I had this way of being that I wanted to, to be, you know, to just, to just follow the impulse. To me, the nomadacy has been directly connected to the embracing of my kind of mystic self of being able to say, you know, I have this memory of wearing my glasses at church and being in a Mother Mary chapel and hearing this message, just leave your glasses, leave your glasses, like I'll heal your eyes, leave your glasses, you know? And I just thought, I can't, my mom would be so mad at me. You know, I can't, I can't leave my glasses. Like, you don't leave at the, te- like, what are you doing? You know? Right. And, and so when I was getting my divorce, it was this feeling of I'm a grown adult now. I, I am becoming more and more self-responsible. I want to leave my glasses uh. on the altar. Like, I just want to listen. Like, what will happen to my life if I just listen? Whether that's staying or going or leaving or giving or taking, like, what will happen? And I'm like kind of two and a half years into that huge embrace and commitment and proclamation to myself. And it's been an incredible, (laughs) incredible two years. It's like I've, in so many ways, I think I've learned so much about how to hold myself. And I'm so grateful for that. Sophia, I loved your story about leave your eyeglasses. That will definitely stick with me for a while. (laughs) Thank you for sharing that. And I know you've gone through a lot and I know you found your way and you found yourself. So tell us what are the life lessons that Mm. you've learned out of all of these experiences? What can you share with our listeners? Mm. I have so many that kind of come to my heart right now. One is to accept and trust your body and your, like what, what we're told are symptoms our communication, their calls, their calls from our wisdom, that our, our soul, our body, our deepest knowing is only asking for the best for us, like really on our side, like not fighting you. Your body's not trying to take you down. It's really not. <laughs> and your emotions aren't trying to take you down. They may be habituated to protect you. And so you may have to work with them to understand what you're protecting yourself against, but to really find a way to breathe in and out and feel your body and your feelings and begin to know how you digest your intuition and your body wisdom, because everybody does it. It's its own intelligence system. So breath. Breath, 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 breath. There's a reason why every indigenous culture, every medicine practice, every research come back and says the breath. There's a reason because it really is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. And there's so much technology out there that is thousands and thousands of years old around certain breathing that will do certain things for your system. So what I can tell you is that there are a number of breathing techniques that I have returned to over and over and over again. So alternate nostril breathing is one of them. And so holding one nostril, holding the other, alternating breathing through the nostrils, it helps balance the, the hemispheres. Or if you're very worked up, just doing one. If you want more energy, just doing the other. So an invitation to learning about breath work. I mean, yoga pranayama is a treasure trove of biotechnology. And so alternate nostril breathing, regulating my breath four by four. So it just doing square breathing, having equal inhale, equal hold, equal exhale, equal hold, Hold. right. Four, four, four. And, and doing those. And the other thing that was very helpful for me, I just gathered every tool I could and used the ones that worked for me. Like it was my job because it was my job. <laughs> yeah, you know? and- very helpful. This information is extremely helpful, Sophia. Thank you so much. And this has been a wonderful dialogue. I myself learned so much in this time that we spoke. So thank you for sharing your knowledge. And like you said, it took you a while to bring all of this together for yourself. Yeah. 
which is why we are sharing knowledge through life lessons so that somebody who is happening to go through the same problem does not have to work so hard and does not have to spend so much yes. time trying to collect That's that right. information. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. This was a my, great talk. My pleasure. I really, I just, you know, I remember in the depths of my suffering, this is one of the prayers that I use and I invite anyone to use it for myself is to use that anger and to use that fury and say like, you better be making something great out of me. You know, like this is one of my prayers was like, I hope this really helps someone someday because this is tough to let that be a motivation. So, so especially that particular journey for me, I, I really pr prayed that prayer a lot that it would, what I learned would, would ease others suffering. And uh, I want to invite people, if there's a question that came up or a particular resource or anything like that, I mentioned my stuff at the beginning and to just go ahead and, and reach out to me. I'm happy to, you know, direct you where I can. Yeah. And for the listeners, if there is a, a reason for you to contact Sophia, her contact information is in the show notes. Sophia, again, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sophia has given us such wonderful life lessons. And as always, I would like to list some of them. Here's one. No matter what the situation is, you have to take your medicine and you, and I underline the word you, you have to find the time to do it. Next, actually my big takeaway from this dialogue with Sophia is when I heard her say, lots of people's lives are changed by practicing for 12 minutes a day, just 12 minutes a day to change their brain chemistry. So I hope listeners are asking themselves, if it just takes 12 minutes a day, then should I not be finding that time for myself? Do I not owe that to myself? Next, she said, breath is a powerful tool. Use it. And lastly, the overwhelming, I'm sorry, I meant the overarching life lesson is accept and trust your body and emotions. They are on your side. This brings us to the end of our episode today. I will come again next Wednesday with another episode of Sharing Life Lessons. Until then, be happy, be safe, and be well.